official meeting of the Save Our Lake, Lake Eleanor. My name is Tim Fleming, and I'll be the moderator this evening, as well as last week, or last month, I should say. And uh, what we have here is a keynote speaker, Natasha, Councilwoman Natasha Johnson. And uh, without any further ado, I want to welcome all the dignitaries. I consider official dignitaries as being elected officials, appointed officials, and employees of the city or state or county. And then there's the residential dignitaries. I consider the residents of Lake Elsinore that care about Elsinore Valley. Because if I start to mention names, I miss one name and I'm in trouble. So I, I literally would have to say everyone's name here because uh, this, this is quite a crowd. I'm, I'm very pleased. Uh, to see the people of, uh, that really matter about taking care of the lake's issues. And uh, we, know, we know that's the focal point of Lake Elsinore. That's the name of Lake Elsinore. So. Without, without any, without the, yeah. the guys say? Further ado. Further ado. There we go. Natasha Johnson. Right. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. All right, so let's see. Laptops here. Pete, do you need to have a special login? Which one do you have? Okay, well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you to the Save the Lake Committee, to Tim, and Pete actually reached out, Pete Dawson actually reached out to me and asked me if I would come and speak. Um, I was actually here in attendance at the first meeting. I was very, I was very impressed as well with the attendance that we, that was here and the people that were interested in learning about where we're at, what our challenges were, and what was taking place and what still was left to be done. So I came and I sat and I listened. And at the end of that meeting, there was a couple of takeaway questions, and I, you know, had to do some. I didn't have those answers, so I decided that I would. Uh, look into them and get back and I had reported back on um, I don't know if those emails went out to the entire committee but I had given some answers and then that's at that point where Pete said would you would you come and speak and I and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I also want to start with saying I was here watching Pat Kilroy give this presentation and I am by no means a biologist of the lake so I don't think I'm going to compare to the biology of the lake. I'm a, a council member by uh, election, but uh, quite honestly, I'm uh, I'm a banker. I've been for 27 years, so I don't. Um, the lake is not my my specialty. However, I've learned a lot, and I think um, I have some things that will be interesting to you because they're some of the takeaway items that were questions at the last meeting. So I'm going to jump right in and say thank you for forming the Save the Lake. It worked. We had a storm. We have water. Great job. <laughs> because I feel like really none of this is important without water. So uh, we are we're really happy to have the influx of water, but we're nowhere near where we need to be. Um, it's not everything. I don't know why this is going to go. Maybe next. Yeah. Okay, so lots of questions about what the, the reading of the lake is. And that's the difference between rainfall and the depth of our lake. Um, we are putting the elevation of the lake up here, and that's what you'll see on the website. You'll also see on the Water District website. Um, so currently, right now, and it may be just a little bit over because these were as of um, January 25th, which um, a couple of these men were getting ready. We do, we do official measurements, and then we do measurements at the end of La Laguna boat launch just for boat safety um, with the depth stick to make sure where we're at. So we're at 1239.32. You can see um, the outflow, the back basin, the levee. And we are looking at that. We're reading the lake daily. The reason why this is important and why we take it at the end of La Laguna is for boat safety. So that you all know, many of you know that live on the lake, that um, Seaport Village, for instance, has been closed for about five years due to the lake elevation. And for the first time in five years, we're happy to report it's this close to being open. So uh, I'm going to get all questions and answers by then. OK, is that OK? Um, so 
we're really excited about that because Seaport, it, you know, we, it's an underutilized opportunity for Lake Elsinore. And we're about, I believe if I'm, I might be a law for a little less than a foot away from opening that up. So that's, that's good. More rain, more rain, more rain. So tonight, um, you, I think when you walked in, you saw some elevations dating all the way back to uh, the early 1900s of our lake. Um, this is the current, kind of the historical elevations of where we're at. You know, we had hit the lowest point in a really long time. Many of this isn't news to anybody. We all know what the, the lake level and the receding of the shoreline and the beachfront. Um, so now we are almost back to optimal, which is 1240. That's our key target, 1240 in elevation. You'll hear that word. You heard it when Pat did the presentation to you all last month if you were here. 1240 is the number everybody should know, and he's absolutely right about that. That's our, our key number, and higher. At 1247, really, that's when we stop putting water into the lake because we need an error of margin to make sure that we don't have flood. So 1240 to 1247 is optimal. The rainfall has definitely made a huge difference. Um, we have a chronological, we didn't just start on May 10th, but we started documenting it for some of our social media, for our website. So in May 10th, you can see at the, at the um, boat launch at La Laguna, and then as of January 26th, it's a huge increase, almost four feet of, of water. So safety for boating, um, in shoreline, all of this has been extremely helpful to us and we didn't have to pay for this water so that's the best part because the water is very expensive and we knew that this plan of ours that is the long-term plan it doesn't work at all without mother nature it has to be included in that plan so the rainfall is um not been very good to us over the last few years but it looks you know if you look back since 1993 we had some of our biggest runs and when you see the peak those are when we've had some, some pretty, we've had flooding or issues. We had the early 90s, <laughs> then again in um, 05, and then the last significant rain was in 2010. So 2010 to 2017, that's where we had such an issue with um, the water and where the lake levels were at. That's a beautiful picture that probably many of you have seen posted on you know, some of the social media's websites. People have been sharing it. Um, it's, it's the Canyon Lake Dam, and um, we'll talk a little bit about that too. So at that 1240, our lake is actually what we consider stabilized as far as water elevations in our sweet spot. Because we are a fresh body of water, because we are a fresh body of water, and we are reliant on the rainfall, we can put water in, but that's really for maintenance. It's not to get us to our elevation level we need. Uh, as many other fresh bodies of water, we don't have an outflow inflow. We are just kind of a holding tank, but we're not a holding tank for any other purpose than recreation, which, which is part of our challenge as well. You know, the typical rain and runoff is uh, 10,000 acre feet a year. So I heard an interesting, an interesting equation today when I was sitting down um, with our partners at the Water District you know, for instance, if we wanted to purchase 3,000 acre foot, that would raise us about one foot in depth to our lake. Okay, 3,000 acre foot. Think about that. And in that price tag in today's world, if we could buy that much water, it would cost about $3 million. But one foot is very quickly in evaporation gone like that. So when you talk about resources and money and where we're allocating that money, we have to make sure that we're going to do this the right way. So buying more water, I know that that was a big topic at the last meeting. Like, how do we get funding to just buy, let's just buy more water. Well, as a recreation body of water, that's not always an option. Um, the other thing is we're state mandated to only put a certain amount of water for highest and best use. Well, highest and best use for recreation in a, in a drought isn't always highest and best use. To us, it's important, but as far as state mandates, that's something to keep into consideration. So we do have local groundwater. We do have the island wells, and um, that is providing water. And just so you know, I, I, I don't want to um, run through all of this and not give you guys an opportunity to ask questions. So if you do have a question, just think about it at the end. Not only will I be answering questions, but if there's something that I can't help you with, I have a representative from the water district here, as well as, well as Lejwa, to help me with some of the the, the partnership part, so we'll have that at the end. But 
But the recycled water, this was the question that I was asked personally. How much recycled water is being put into our lake? Is the water district doing that? How, how do we know and how are we sure that this is happening? Well, it is happening. This stat of 5 million gallons per day, approximately 2 feet per, per year, is an approximation. Something to keep into consideration is that because it's recycled water in conservation, people aren't always using as much water. Therefore, not all of that water is, that estimation is an average. So when we say we're putting 5 million gallons, it may not be every single day. And, that, and that's important. Um, however, the averages do show this is very almost on the point as far as how much we're putting in. Um, the other part that was really important to this group that I wanted to give a, uh, a personal answer to was how much money is the city spending and how much money is the water district spending to put in as our partnership and our allocation of funding for the lake. $750,000 per agency. So the city is doing $750,000 as well as the water district doing $750,000. Um, there was some confusion that it was only $750,000. So a million and a half collaboratively is what we're putting in together every single year. We have not missed a year. We've not, not put late money towards the lake or spent that money for the water. With that being said, as, co as costly as water is, the evaporation um, is a significant obstacle for us because of high temperatures. We don't have a lot of um, movement, like I talked about, and outflow and inflow. So we are evaporating just naturally at four and a half feet a year. That is without Mother Nature, we will just naturally evaporate. So with the influx of rain and what we're putting in with recycled water, that's where we're going to get our lake to its optimal elevation. Some of the things that have already been done or have become action items or implementations of the planning that the city has with partners such as the Water District as well as um, Lejwa uh, in 2002, the island wells were improved. 2003, the axial flow pumps were put in. 2004, the island wells pumped into the wetlands. 2007, we had the aeration systems come on. 2008, we have the permanent pipe. Um, a big cost was done at that to help. And 2009, the phosphorus removal. And this was new. I didn't even know. I was elected in 2012. I had no idea that there was phosphorus removal in 2009. And it's something that we could, that we did, and we could do. So that that was um, that was very interesting to find that out. 2017, we had um, the almost two million dollar recycled water pipeline to the lake project. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about that because these are just some of the things that came online. We still have more. We have more things coming and future. But I want to dive into what we heard was a big consideration and concern, which is the aeration for the lake. So again, not a biologist. I asked for a full explanation of why this and what does this do and when is the best use for it. Because there was sightings or Pat Kilroy spoke about that Dr. Anderson, who had done this wonderful study and has been studying our lake for a long time, said that these were there was optimal use for the aeration system and when we should and shouldn't use it, and why is it not on 24-7. Well, there's a reason for that. It's most effective when we have lower um, we have lower temperatures and the oxygen is lower in the I know, the lower part of our lake. So the way it was explained to me, and I hope that this is helpful, many of you probably know way more than I do about the lake, but the water columns, there's less oxygen in the, lo in the lower part of the lake. So what we're doing is we're not putting oxygen into the lake, we're mixing up the water, where the water column down there where the oxygen is much lower. And so when we're infusing it, mixing it around at optimal levels isn't always helpful. It's also not always helpful to do it at certain times of the year. Fall is one of the best times of the year to do it. And so that's why you see, you don't see it on all the time. People ask me all the time, I don't see the bubbles in the middle of the lake. Does that mean we're not running? We quite possibly could not be running. And there is a reason for that. So during the summer season, longer operation times are not more beneficial because it's hotter. That, that is um, not a, a true statement. Uh, not only have I asked to make sure, but um, actually the study by Dr. Anderson doesn't actually say that either. He says the optimal time for it 
is um, to do that in the fall. Mixing of the lake is helping our oxygen levels, but it's not putting oxygen into the lake. That's what our, um, the oxygen lines are for. So I hope that this is a little bit more helpful as far as when we run it and what it's actually used for. Getting the, the full amount of runoff and water to the lake is also very important, so the recycled water pipeline. Um, this is kind of hard to see, but you can find this on Elsinore Valley Municipal's Water District uh, website. And basically it just shows from the home and where the recycled water goes. So it kind of travels and how, how it actually, where we get it from, how we get it to the lake. Now with the new pipeline project, which tonight on that back table, there are flyers about this project. It's, gonna, it's really going to help us get all of that water that's run out, that's being evaporated or going through some of the flood channels and we're not getting that, it's not making its way to the lake. So while it's a big cost, it's going to be very helpful for us because that's water, it's priceless. The, um, the current flood control channel has many obstacles, as many of you know, and a lot of those things are vegetation. I mean, um, we've got cleanups, we've got sometimes um, urban outdoorsmen living in flood channels, and there's challenge. There's lots of challenges. Um, so this will help ensure that that water is funneling appropriately to our lake. Nobody wants to say this word, but fish kills are a reality of having a large body of water. It's, it is a reality. It's, it's part of Mother Nature. Um, one of the things that, if, if you've lived here for any amount of time, I've only lived here, this will be my 19th year here, so I haven't lived here a really, really, really long time and heard, I've heard some of those stories. Um, however, I know that in, um, I was here in 98 when we had one of the largest fish kills. I feel like that's when we got our reputation of, um, you know, what no, no one wants to say, which smells more, we all, we've all heard it. And, and um, you know, it, it didn't give us a good reputation. And then again in 2009, we had, you know, about 50 tons. And then in 2015, well, some people didn't even know we had one because um, we cleaned up very, very quickly. We still have one. We just were able to get it cleaned up so that the smell didn't linger for days and days and days. And um, we used our community partnerships to get that um, handled and addressed very, very quickly. Within, within less than 36 hours, there was not a single fish on the beach. So that, that was very important. But this is, this is gonna happen. Um, it will probably happen again in our resident while well, we're all alive and here. And, um, but what we're gonna do is implement and continue on with Lake Watch, which is what we implemented in 2015, at the end of 15 and beginning of 16. So we took a multi-agency approach and asked our partners to help us um, so that when we did, if in fact we did have a fish kill, that we were able to get it cleaned up very quickly. We actually even partnered with a company that took our fish kill and turned it into pet food because we didn't want to waste it. So working, looking at partnerships like that was something that we had done for the first time. We also, um, we have people looking at the watch and we take, um, we have staff going down and looking at the lake shore and the beachfront because that's when you'll know pretty much the shad will start to happen. You'll start to see the shad die off and then, then it's imminent of possibly a larger fish kill. So when that happens, we'll get, and it doesn't always happen based on the heat. It's not always about higher temperatures. It really is about our elevation and, and what's going on in the biology of the lake. So knock on wood, so far it's been a good year. 2016 was a good year. 2017 we're hoping will be another good year for us. Um, the longer we can span out these these what we call occurrences, uh, the better. As, as you know, from 98 to 2005, we had a good amount of water in the lake, so we didn't have as much um, problem with fish kills. So we do have a, we have a plan, and we have a quick remedy for fish kills when they happen. The toxicity level is another um, hot topic. Everyone wants to know what's the bacteria level in the lake, how often are we testing, um, why did we close the lake, why haven't we fully opened the lake again? These are all questions that come up probably on a regular basis. So we, back in um, June, when we originally started seeing that there was bacteria, higher levels of bacteria in the lake, the city council at the time decided we um, ultimately were going to end up closing the lake because of uh, the bacteria. However, it was lower than the recommended 
level at which you should close a natural body of water. There were other surrounding lakes doing it, and we thought to protect our residents, we were going to go ahead and be proactive and close it down. Um, there was weekly testing being done of our lake up in that point. However, we didn't have any significant mitigating factors to show that the results were going to change. What I mean by that was there was no change in weather, we didn't have any rainfall, and the results came back the, pretty much the same week after week after week. Because we decided, okay, you know what, we're going to stop the weekly testing until we get something that changes. And now we've moved to monthly testing. We knew the storm was coming, the two-week storm event we just had. We knew that that was coming, and we have decided to wait until just this next week, and we're going to retest to see what the bacteria levels are at that point. Um, we have seen they have dropped significantly, which is why it's, it's open for recreation. Until we know completely to the T, we're not going to recommend any active bodily contact in the lake. However, I will tell you personally, um, my children and I were there this last weekend um, uh, when there was a moment of sunshine in between all the rain. We went down to the beach and, you know, we kind of ran around in it with our shoes off. And um, I'm not afraid of what's in our lake. I think that that's a big story right now, that the toxicity of our level is killing animals. It's, it's, um, it's not safe for our dogs to drink that water. And we took a proactive approach. And there may have been some agree, some people that agree with that process or that you disagree, but the city of Lake Elsinore wanted to make sure that everybody was protected and you had enough information. So we're going to continue to update you as soon as we take our next um, testing. And we're not the only ones doing the testing independent. Um, we're having independent testing done. We had a contract with another company. We're going to continue with that contract as well as Elsinore Valley Municipal Water District is testing as well. We will collaborate with our results. We will post them as well. So something we can do to help um, with not only the fishery, but the biology and the stability of our lake is our fish stockings. And um, this has been something that people have asked, why are we spend, spending money to, fish, to put fish in the lake when our lake wasn't healthy, quote unquote, or there was bacteria levels, or it was so low? Well, part of that is, um, the reason is, we were putting very um, carnivorous fish in there, and that's helpful to our lake. You know, you want them to eat some of the things that are causing the higher uh, algae blooms. You want the fish to be circulating in there. And the fishery is a good depiction of how, stabili how stabilized our lake is. So just in 2016, um, the numbers are up there, catfish, largemouth bass, bluegill, um, crappie, and then, um, you know, we did it again in May and June. And um, we put a, a great deal of resources into the fish stocking, and I, from what I understand, we're about to do it again next week. Um, and we're, we're excited about that. We're going to continue to advocate for resources like this because we want the fishery to be healthy. Um, the game fish are helpful because they also help, from what I understand, with some of the things that are like the shad, the overpopulation of shad. Um, and with the game fish, they're going to help us keep up that at a reasonable number, so there's not an, a, an out of balance or the lake isn't out of whack with one or the other. Again, not a biologist, but the easiest way I know how to explain that is balance. <laughs> uh, we're using those to help balance out. So when I sat here last month, I, I heard, well, what can we do? What, what is it that the Save the Lake Committee can do? What is it that um, a group of people who really care about what's happening in our lake, which is the center and the gem of our city. We believe that. I believe that personally. Um, I don't stand before you to tell you that I believe that to give you a bunch of lip service, or, or I wouldn't be here. Um, quite honestly, I, I serve as the Economic Development Commi uh, Committee member for the council with my partner, um, Mr. Steve Manos, and we talk about this in every opportunity we get for economic development because we believe it's centered around our lake. <laughs> That is what sets us apart from any other city um, in this area. So, with that being said, it is a natural body of lake, a natural body of water lake, and um, it will never be designated a reservoir or a drinking reservoir. Reservoir, as you know from Pat's um, presentation about the chronological history of our lake, in 1963 it was deeded to, from the state to the city, and it has to maintain be maintained as a recreational body of water. Therefore, it cannot be drinking. Um, we have, as a city, for the first time in 2016, we hired a federal lobbyist. 
that is where the federal funding will come in because without Mother Nature's help and federal funding, the lake's future success is, is not even an option. We need water and we need federal funding. We cannot raise enough money to buy the kind of water that we will need to keep the lake at that 1240 to 1247. Um, it would be an ongoing, exhausting uh, cause that with evaporation and what we have as far as temperatures, it, unless we shorten the footprint of the lake, Truly, it, it, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be an option. Now there is talks of that. There there's maybe some talks of changing some of the footprint of the lake because it is so large. Um, the federal lobbyist is um, is working, and then what we have done now is you know the, the water district also has a lobbyist. So partnering with those two efforts to really the water district is there a lot more often than we are, and looking for opportunities. For not only we're not just talking grants, but we're talking some real federal help to get um, some bigger projects done. Our, the strengths in what we have is um, creating a really great fishery and keeping the fish habitat healthy. That that does a lot. That gets us in the right direction. Water is not, is obviously um, uh, you know I, I keep saying it it's priceless, and I'm not going to tell you that that is the answer to most of this. Is just keeping that water level healthy. But education is the next biggest part. Um, the education of our lake, people don't understand our lake. They don't understand what a natural body of water has. It did, they don't understand its challenges. Um, you know, they think the, the coloring, if you were here for the last presentation, that that's unhealthy. And all of those things, as we know, if, you're, if you have um, you know, a love for the lake, that's all a part of a natural fresh body of water. We're proud of that. Do we want it to be crystal clear blue? Well, yeah, we want it to be, but it, it never will be. You'll never look down to the bottom of Lake Elsinore and, and see the bottom of the lake. That's not what we have. So with our partnerships in education, I think that this group is really going to be helpful. Because my goal now for 2017 is going to be to educate people on the lake. Um, what we can and what we can't do. What's a possibility and what's not a possibility. And we don't want to spin people's wheels in and, and get them going for something that is never going to come to fruition. So what I can tell you with all of that is um, the long-term plan is um, to update some of the equipment that is actually putting more oxygen into the lake. That's actually very viable. I heard at the last meeting there was some floating islands that were used way earlier. We looked back into that. We're looking for that study. Um, no one seems to be able to know. Maybe Mr. Fleming has some documents from he pulled out from 84. Okay. Yes, I remember. I remember. I, yeah, I heard that at the last meeting. So. Okay. Well, well, I'm I'm here as a guest. I I would love to see it, and we can talk after because um, I did bring that back up to staff, and that's definitely a consideration for the cost at what you. Explained for about eleven hundred dollars. I mean, that's definitely something uh, per island is what I heard that the study costs. So, okay, well, we'll talk afterwards. We'll talk afterwards. Um, but, but as far as um, future opportunities uh, for what we can do as a community, we have to provide awareness. When more people understand what the lake is doing, more people are going to. Um, take better care of our lake. Another problem is helping the region understand what our lake is. You know, we have people in other cities and, and just surrounding communities that don't understand. They think we can just, you know, open up the Canyon Lake Dam and or we can pull from bodies of water. Well, not everybody has designated the kind of body of water we are, and that's really important to help them understand. We thank Canyon Lake for overflowing. The gates have opened for the first time in five years, um, and not only did we get some water, we got a good a little amount of new fishery too that came with it um, so that was very helpful but we need honestly to continue that so the great pack in the sierras this is how i see it the great pack in the sierras only helps us continue because come february and march it's what we consider our wet season so for lake elsinore that's where we're expected to get a little bit more rainfall the storm we're going to get this week or next is going to maybe water your lawns it's not going to help our lake but if we continue to get good pack in the Sierras, as that comes down and other bodies of water are already full because of the great influx we got just two weeks, you know, a week and a half ago, 
That's where we continue to keep the water levels up. It's cooler right now. We're not evaporating as quickly. And now is the time to where we're going to continue to keep that elevation levels up. Um, the last thing I want to say is when I was asked these questions about how much is the city, what is the city doing to protect our lake, what, what opportunities, um, I have to be honest with you and tell you I didn't know all of the answers. Uh, as a council member, I thought, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask these questions. And I kept asking staff, and, and you know, there were some things where we had to figure out from our partners what, what exactly was being done. But I want to assure you, um, after this meeting, I probably received about 22, I think it was 22 or 23 phone calls. Is the city really putting water into the lake? Well, I can assure you the city is putting water into the lake on a daily basis. Um, at 5 million gallons a day, on average. That is a number that you can that you can rest assured that we are doing. We're going to continue to look for opportunities, like the pipeline project, if you want to take a look at it, the flyers on the back table, that is going to make sure that we get more water into the lake. We're going to continue with the fish stocking. We're going to look for federal funding. We've reached out to our congressmen, our senators, as well as our assembly partners, and we're asking for them to help us with the federal funding as well, because when they're on our side and they understand where we're at, then that just makes us more powerful in the collaboration. So with that being said, I just want to thank you for inviting me to talk. I don't think I gave you any stellar news tonight that was mind-blowing. However, um, I, you can be assured that not only did I stand up here uh, very truthfully, as my colleague is right here, Mr. Um, Daryl Hickman, council member, thank you. Thank you. You should all thank him for coming because last time there was not only one of us. So And so he's here in support. And I will tell you that um, all of this is knowledge that you can count on. So um, with that, I'm going to open it up to questions and answers. And if I can't give you the answer, we will provide it at some point for you, or one of our partners will do that. Okay. All right. Do you want me to sit down? No. Okay. <laughs>